Hello everyone. Welcome to our class. My name is Ko Chen Li. In today's section, we will continue to talk about the computer hardware installations. Let's review the previous sections for computer hardware installation we have covered. First, we mentioned the main hardware components we need to build up a computer. We talked about how to install a CPU to the motherboard, then showed you how to mount CPU fan onto the CPU to dissipate the heat generated by the CPU, how to install motherboard to the case, then we showed you how to install RAM, hard drive, and VGA card. In these sections, we will continue to show you how to complete the hardware installations, including cabling, power supply, and other I.O. devices. There are generally two buses within the computers, the internal bus, sometimes called the front side bus, or FSB for short. The internal bus allows the processors to communicate with the system's central memory, the RAM. The expansion bus sometimes called the input-output bus, allows various motherboard components, USB, serials, and payroll port cards inserted in PCI connectors, hard drives, CD-ROMs, and CD-RW drives, etc., to communicate with one another. However, it is mainly used to add new devices using what are called expansion slots connected to the input output bus. What we show you here are various kinds of expansion buses we need to connect to the corresponding devices to the computer. The case is power switch and the indicator light, reset switch, and the hard drive light are usually connected at the motherboard's lower front corner. LEDs pass current in only one direction, and positive pins normally connect to the colored wire on each LED. A black or white LED while usually indicates negative or ground state. USB connectors have been standardized for several years. The missing pin locations is blocked by most front panel USB connectors to assure that the connector is plugged correctly. IDE and serial ATA are different types of interfaces to connect storage devices like hard drives to a computer's system bus. Serial ATA stands for Serial Advanced Technology Attachments, or Serial ATA. And IDE is also called Parallel ATE, ATA or PATA. Serial ATA is the newest standard, and Serial ATA drives are faster than PATA, IDE drives. For many years, ATA provided the most common and the least expensive interface for this application. But by the beginning of the 2007, Serial ATA had largely replaced IDE in all new systems. IDE consists of a 40 pins connector attached to a ribbon cable. 
each IDE bus can connect at most two devices. To plug in the IDE ribbon cables, make sure you position them according to the master slab setting you set earlier. Most modern IDE cables are set to one connect in one orientation. But if yours isn't, then make sure to direct the red stripe on IDE cable towards the power connector on the drive. And the process for connecting both rounded and ribbon IDE cables is the same. IDE cables snap into the motherboard in one, only one direction. Using the blue end of the cable, the cable plugs into the IDE interface controllers on the motherboard, which is typically located on the outer edge of the board near the drives. Your motherboard may have two IDE connectors usually marked IDE 1 and IDE 2. Consult your motherboard or PC menu for the spe specific locations of your system's IDE connectors. And the picture shows the complete of the IDE and serial ATA buses installations. You can connect one IDE cable to the primary IDE 1 controllers on the motherboard and use that cable for the hard drive or optical drive. And then use a separate cable that you plug into the IDE 2 controller for additional drives. You could attach both drives to one cable in a mass slave configuration but this can hurt the drive's performance. So we recommend using two separate cables. However, using just one cable does mean less clutter inside your case, which can keep components cooler. And the performance of a computer can be directly tied it to the power supply. If the power supply does not supply enough power to meet the computer's demands, the computer may run slowly and with poor performance or may not at all. As shown in the picture, power supply box looks like a large box out of which a bundle of wires run and connects to the power core jack on the outside of the computer case. Align the power supply into place in the case so that the four mounting holes align properly. Make sure that any air intake fans on the power supply that resides in the case is facing toward the center of the case and not towards the case cover. The power supply needs to be held in place while it is fastened to the case with screws. If the case has a shelf ledge that the power supply sits on, it will be easier to balance. And make sure that the voltage switch on the back of the power supply is set to the proper voltage level for your country. North America and Japan uses 110, 115 volt, while Europe and many other countries use it 220 and 230 volts. In most cases, the switch will come present to the voltage settings for your region. The standard ATM mount points on the power supplies are all the same. 
in some cases, you may need to remove the CPU coolers or top of the case to gain full access. For tower cases, it is usually easiest to place the case on its side. As then you can reset, you, you can rest the power supply on its side. Once it's done, press the power supply into computers and screw the screws into the back of the power supply. If the computer already has the motherboard installed into it, the power LEDs from the power supply need to be plugged in. Most modern motherboards use a large ATX power connectors that gets plugged into the sockets on the motherboard. Some motherboards require an additional amount of power through a 4-pin ATX 12-volt connectors. Plug this in if required. The oddly named ATX 12-volt connector is specifically designed it to power the processors within a clean 12-volt supply and should be powered from its own 12-volt rail. The original and current versions is a square four pins design. That is suitable for more motherboards. However, high-end Intel motherboards, mostly sockets, 1366 models, requires an upgraded eight pins version. So check your motherboard before buying. And six pins and eight pins PCI Express power connectors are almost only every required by mid to high-end graphic cards. Depending on the models, a card may require one or two six-pin connectors or one six-pin and one eight-pin. If you plan to run dual graphic cards, then this is obvious, obviously doubled. A number of items reside within the computer case that require power from the power supply. The most common device is the various hard drives and CD, DVD drives. Typically, these use the four pin Molex style connectors. Locate the appropriate size power LEDs and plug them into any devices that require power. The other kind of connector is serial ATA, as, not, as shown in the picture. The IDE and Serial ATA power connectors are usually used to power any optical drives and hard drives in the system. The old 4-pin Molex connectors mostly come into play here. Serial ATA hard drives is the final exception requiring the Serial ATA power connectors but many drives provide connectors from Molex as well. In this circumstance, only use one or the other, not both. And this is the complete of the power supply installations. And leaving cables wrong boards or overrun inside a case inhibits air flows and can lead to a system running harder than it has to. It's always worth taking a, li a little time to wrap, tuck, and tie up cables for a neat finish. So one last thing to do, keep the cable organized. 
you can ensure that straight wires or cable doesn't touch the fans which will produce noise and increase the heat around critical components. Fan can also burn out this way. You can improve airflow throughout the case so that the entire system remains cool and stable. And good cable organization allows you to find the wire or cables you need when you have to unwind them to change out a component. And this is the complete of the computer hardware installations. The next thing is to connect the I.O. devices to get the computer working. We will show you how to connect monitors, keyboard, and mouse. Most of today's monitors are plug and play, which means that all, all one must do is attach the monitor to the computer, plug in the power cord, and turn on both devices. Parts of computer monitors include monitor, monitor cable, and plug. We need to make sure that the interface of the monitor cable must fit to the VGA car. Even though most computer monitors today are LCD panels, there is still a number of different ways to connect them to your computer. Monitor connections vary on both the type and size of the monitor. Some older monitors will use an analog VGA cable, while newer monitors will use a digital signal over DVI, HDMI, or display port cables. The process of installation is easy. The first step is to connect the monitor to PC. Connect your VGA or DVI cable from your monitor to the video output port on the back of your computer case. Screw in the fastening sound scooter on both sides of cable if they are present. The second step is to connect the power core of the monitor. Position the monitor so its cores can easily reach the outlet or power strip in the back of the computer tower. Plug the monitor into the outlet or power strip. Modern computer keyboards were modeled after and are still very similar to classic typewriter keyboards. Many different layouts are available around the world, but most keyboards are of the query type. Keyboard may, may be wild or wireless, but they always communicate with the computer via PS2 or USB connections, usually located on the motherboard. Even though the keyboard sits outside the main computer housing, it is an essential part of the complete system. Wild keyboard and mice are the most common basic plug and play devices on a computer. Normally, as soon as you connect them to the computer, they will work because you need them in order to log into your systems. If your keyboard or mouse doesn't, doesn't work, you will probably need to install the software drive drivers from a disk or the web. Installation is easy. First, you need to check the types of keyboard and mouse connector to see if there is an interface for you to connect to the PC. Usually, two types of interface are used commonly today, PS2 and USB. 
When connecting the PS to keyboard, ensure the computer is off. If the keyboard is a USB keyboard, the computer can be off or on during the, during the install installations. Now, the moment of truth. Now you can turn your computer on and see if it works. If there is a switch on the back of the power supply, make sure it is on. Then push the power switch on the front of the case. In the ideal case, four things will happen. You will see here the fans spin up. You will hear the hard disk spin up. And lights will light on the case. You will see something happening on the monitors to indicate that the motherboard is alive. If you see, hear all of that happening, you are successful. You have created a working machine Using the menu that came with the motherboard, you can enter the BIOS screens and make sure everything looks okay. Chances are you will need to set the machine's date time, but that is probably all you have to do. Everything else is probably automatic. All the drives will be recognized and auto configured configured it and the default setting on the motherboard will be fine. 